loves us and how much we can love others. Lord, Lord, every day, God, we thank you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. Amen. God, just give the Lord a round of applause. Love, grace, and mercy. Great to be with you. Why don't you everybody turn and say hello to someone this morning? We'll take a few minutes. Great. Good morning. It's great to see you. Turkish. So good. Great job, guys. Great job. It's so hot. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Greenhouse Project. My name is John. If we have not met, I think I know everybody here. There's like probably nobody here that I don't know. Okay. Um, it's great to be with you guys. Happy Sunday. Um, if anybody does not remember, it has been six days since the Eagles played in the Super Bowl. Um, and I'm still a little bit hurt by it, but a couple announcements. We have daily breads. These uh, come from a ministry. They're three months. They're, they're, they're for three months. This is the March, April, and May. They're brand new over there. Please take one. Put it where you read regularly. If you, have, if, if you want to take a few, give one out to a friend. It's a great tool. It just gives a little nugget of God's word every single day. It, 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 I would say this is your snack. Okay, where the word is your meal. This is a snack that you can keep with you at all times and have access to God's word. We also have Bibles over there. If you need a Bible, grab one. There's little pocket Bibles too. If you want to take something with you while you travel, you'll be able to have God's word wherever you go. Um, we have a, a list in the back that sign up to watch our kids. If anybody's interested in helping with our kids' church, there's always kids to watch. Every Sunday lately, we've been having the kids meet next door with Emily's mom, but that's not our long-term solution. We're asking for everybody to get in and, and, and to help out. And really, if you want to grow, get into the Word of God. But if you really want to grow, hang out with some kids. They will push your buttons in every way possible. Trust me, it's worth it. Uh, every Monday night, we host a Christ-centered recovery meeting here. It starts at 7 p.m. Uh, I would really suggest everybody come out at some point. Come out and hear the testimonies or the message or the people that are coming to speak. Tomorrow night we have Matt Dunphy, who's been a longtime friend of mine, uh, to come out and, and, and to really share a powerful testimony. That's tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Uh, starting Wednesday, the first week of March, uh, whatever the first Wednesday is, we're going to be hosting family dinner here. And it takes place of our discipleship where we were meeting on Tuesday. We're pushing everything into Wednesday where we have after school club here. And then afterwards, we're going to do family dinner. We want everybody to come. It's going to be an important time for us to meet together, to eat, to fellowship, and then to talk about how, um, God's word and how he's calling us to grow, i.e. discipleship. It's going to be a time for us to connect with people, but also get into smaller groups to talk about what's really going on in our world also, we're going to be highlighting a monthly uh, discipline or a virtue out of God's word for us to follow together as a church and individually. Uh, and me and Donnie and our team have been praying about this uh, for a while. We really feel it's going to be a great step for us to be able to continue our family bond, to stay small, and to grow uh, as individuals. So put that on your calendar. And here's the next big thing coming up. It's next Saturday, February 25th. This is our first official outreach for 2023. Uh, literally, we have not really had a real winter. So we're going to be able to get out in our community. And it's the first time we're one church with two locations. Technically, we have three locations. But we're serving in two different communities. We're going to be here probably from like 11 to 1230, knocking on doors, praying with people, handing out our flyer, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, picking up trash. We'll be here for about an hour, hour and a half, and then we're going to go over to the 912 community and go out there and knock on doors and pray for people and literally uh, be the hands and feet that we talk about in the Word. A lot of times we're really good at talking about things and not applying them. Here we want to be able to do both well. So uh, the 912 community is going to be especially important for us because it's our first time going out and inviting people to something in the future. So over on the west side, we are going to have 
church on Sunday nights. We're, we're going to have a food outreach. We're going to hopefully launch after school programs for kids and just have a lot of opportunities for one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationship making. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, so if you're interested in any of our opportunities that we talked about today, the best place to go is our website, ghproject.org. You can learn all about us there. And if anybody does give, or uh, that's a place to give, you can go right online, or there's an anonymous box over here that you can uh, give into. So uh, check out our website for more information. All right, we are in Second John this week. I just want to uh, pray, and we will get into our message. We're going to look at the whole book today. That really sounds awesome. It's 13 verses, okay? So... <laughs> We're going to do 2 John this week and 3 John next week. So, man, let's pray. Father God, thank you. God, thank you for your faithfulness. God, your word literally says those that are forgiven much, love much. As a result of what you have done in this world, also in our hearts and minds and souls, God, thank you for who you are for your redemption, that you are love and that you love us. God, thank you that you can give us this letter written by John that is going to highlight what it really means to walk in your truth. These 13 verses may not seem like a lot, but your word is powerful, God. It's sharp enough to divide joint and marrow to get to the root of the issue. Thank you for being our Lord, our Savior, our God, and our friend. Bless this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Winnie the Pooh. It's great to start off any message talking about Winnie the Pooh, right? Um, Winnie the Pooh said, to get where you're going, you need to leave where you are. Now, I don't know about you, but I like being in a certain place. I don't like to move. I like to stay consistent. I want to be the same. I want to change all the time, right? Like, I want things to change. Like, I want to be skinnier, but I want to sit on the couch most of the time, all right? But... Walking takes us places. And what we're going to highlight in this letter tonight is what it, today, what it means to walk in truth. And literally, I just think of Wendy all the time, to get where you're going. You literally need to leave where you are. And that's uncomfortable. It's not fun or exciting. A lot of times it's heartbreaking and challenging. I remember when I was a kid, I, I grew up in, in Morton, a few miles away from here. And we, were, we lived one block away from the Morton Police Station. And by the way, if there's any stories of me being a kid, they're usually not good if you haven't figured it out. I'm the problem in this situation. So uh, about a block from our house behind the police station was the woods, and like we played in the woods and made forts in the woods and trails, and I set the woods on fire once. That's a story for another time. Uh, but at one point next to the police station, there was an old school. And the school closed down, and it was boarded up, and... Uh, one day, me and my friends were playing in the woods, and we decided, how cool would it be to get into this school that was boarded up? We just wanted to try to find out what was in there and how we could mess around. And literally, I was the instigator in all the shenanigans. And man, we had so much fun trying to figure out a way to bust into this place. And we literally did, and ran around this broken, messed up building that was like missing pieces of floor and locations and asbestos and just broken down, leftover school stuff. We just wanted to explore and to have a ton of funs, a ton of fun. And uh, what I've learned is that uh, fences and boundaries have a purpose, all right? The purpose is to literally keep people out, but for people like me, I'm trying to figure out how to get in. We always say do, uh, locks are meant to keep honest people honest, okay? Right? For people that aren't honest, it's a way to be able to break in. You can choose to walk or go any way you want, but it doesn't mean that you're actually walking with God. There's a way that's true and right to think, walk, and talk. Literally, we broke into the police station and to the place next door to it, and uh, long story short, after wandering around there for a few days and telling all our friends in the community, one day, literally, the police show up at my house, right? And this wasn't the first time this happened. And we might have been like 10 or 11 years old. And 
uh, uh, the mayor of Morton literally lived right next door to us, and it became like a really big deal when my parents found out. We had to go back down with them and show them how we broke in so they could board up the place and make sure nobody else got in there. And thank God nobody got hurt. It was literally missing floor joists. But the point was that, that, that there was a boundary that we decided to break to go into a place we weren't supposed to be. And I know now that I can choose to go any way that I want, but it doesn't mean that I'm walking with God. We should all know that truth is definitive. It means it's complete and final. Like answers yes or no. Here's a big one. Do you like pickles on your sandwich? Okay? It's either a yes or a no. Nobody ever says maybe to that situation. So who are pickles on the sandwich people? Please raise your hand. Okay. Everybody else, please leave. Who's, who, who's not a pickle person here? It depends. I'm a You're a maybe? You're a maybe? Wow, okay. So, the point behind that is truth is usually definitive. Usually it's a, it's a hard yes. Not usually. It's a hard yes or a hard no. There's usually not a middle line other than you two weird people with pickles. Literally... We are in 2 John, and he wrote this letter to a specific woman who he purposely knew and loved in Christ. And you know what she was leading? A house church, just outside of Ephesus. It might have looked similar to this. Now, there was no church building, so people literally gathered in homes that were big enough to fit the group of people, and they met uh, sometimes daily, but they definitely met weekly for food, fellowship, prayer, and the apostles' doctrine. The purpose of John writing this letter is to exhort, meaning to er encourage or to urge all believers, no matter what was going on. He's looking to encourage and to highlight a specific point on how to walk in love and in truth. This woman literally takes a stand for truth, but others in the church start to criticize, backbite, turn against her for standing up for the truth. She also believes in what she's standing for actually is an error that John's trying to correct. We'll talk about it in a minute. John reminds her that those, even though they have ungodly behavior that are in the church, are meant to be corrected and to love and encourage and to guide it back to the truth. At the same time, John is encouraging this elect chosen lady to stand against false teachers and to not let them in her home. So we have this challenge coming on. Who do we keep in and who do we keep out? It seems like the lines get blurred along the way. And I think we can all understand that. Who do we keep in and who do we keep out? You want to know why this is important? The word says bad company corrupts good behavior. Now, social media does this. I don't know if anybody's ever done this. You ever watch videos of somebody like cursing or doing something, and then like a little bit later on, like you start to curse in your head, or you start to curse in your mind? Oh, I'm the only one that's ever done that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bad company corrupts good behavior. You see things, you witness them, you want to indulge in those things. If you're around somebody, you know, th- this is why certain groups of people always gravitate towards one another, law of attraction. Why do you think a bunch of junkies can get together and do junky things, right? Why do you think a bunch of Christians can get together and witness the gospel? Bad company corrupts good behavior. The word tells us to make no provision for the flesh whatsoever. No, zero, zip, zilch. Don't give any foothold for sin to get in to take us captive to cause us to walk in a way that's away from God's truth. We have to stand for truth, and with that being said, it means... We must know the truth. In standing for truth, we are to be gentle, kind, peaceable, and give an open door for all, and walk with people even through their ungodly behaviors. Do you know how I know that? Because we have little kids, all right? And I talk about it a lot, but Max tries to murder his sister like 14 times a day. He'll lick the couch, he'll lick your face, you know, he'll... Do something, and then you're like, don't throw stuff at your sister. And then you turn around, and Ava's sitting in the corner, and Max has all of his toys, literally throwing them at his sister, laughing out loud. Like, he thinks it's the best thing ever. We're to walk through, we don't discard people. We walk people through 
the ungodly behaviors and point them back to truth. For the church, on the outside, it says all are welcome. Everybody is welcome. Everybody can come through these doors. At the same time for standing in troop, truth, we keep away fellowship from those who do not have the same confession. It means the same mind. We don't allow false teachers in our home. All are welcome. Here's the truth, but not all belong. Especially those that are trying to destroy, to sow discord, to deceive. All can come, but only those that drink the blood belong. And this has always been a challenge for us as the church. Some fellowships deny the truth of God's word and follow common social justice trends. Like, oh, we should just love everybody and everybody can come in and they can do whatever they want and it's okay. We just love them. The word says you can exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature over the creator. There's a time where people can deny the truth of what's going on in this world and literally serve and worship after Satan. We, as the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, are to know the truth, practice the truth, and protect the truth. And this is what we're going to talk about today in walking in God's truth. We're to know the truth, practice the truth, and protect the truth. Here we are, verses 1 through 3. It says, To the elect, means chosen, lady and her children, whom I love in truth, not only I, but those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father, And from the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, in truth and love. This letter starts off with the elder. John identifies himself as the elder. It's a definite definite article. The Greek word, presbyteros, means elder or old man. We would commonly interchange the words overseer, deacon, pastor, elder, Uh, But John here is the elder. Why? Because he is the last living apostle. He was chosen by Christ. He was called, walked with him, witnessed everything that happened. He knew his voice. He slept with him, ate with him, touched his side. He saw him uh, before. They saw him when he rose again. And he was commissioned specifically by Jesus to walk out this calling that he has. He's the last overseer that walked with Jesus, the last apostle that was living. He's writing to a very specific person, a lady and her children. It says, elect meaning chosen, the lady in Greek, kuros, which means Lord, but it's used in the feminine way, which is why we get the word lady here. And what we do know is, according to John, this lady has the authority over a house, over her children, and she's responsible for this house church. The words keep house in scripture can relate to rule or manage the house. You know what that means? She was very important to the kingdom of God. She was very important to the community that was serving right outside of Ephesus. John absolutely loves them in truth, meaning they had a common bond in love as a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's this common bond that we have in love, in Christ, for anybody that's a fellow believer. It makes us family, by the way. We shouldn't have anything against one another. We can pick up here, move somewhere else, and we walk in, and we get to say, brother and sister, I love you. I never, Maybe I never met you before. But John has this relationship with them. He knows some of her kids. He sees something, and he hears something from a distance that's important to, 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 to write, important enough for him to write a letter to her. She and her kids stood on the gospel of Jesus Christ. No other teachings or any false teachings. You've got to remember during this time, no written Bible. Yes, they may have had some papyruses. They may have had some written epistles that people copied down that, that they kept. But they didn't, have the, 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 they didn't have God's word, the good news as we know it today. See, truth, God's truth, is not what you think should be right, but what is God has established to be true, guess what? Before the foundations of the world. He didn't make stuff up as he went along. 
It's all been established. God's truth never changes. Never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is truth. He is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus came to testify the truth. Now, God's truth always becomes exercised in love. At the same time, we can't have communion with those who do not share the same spiritual bond with Jesus Christ. Communion, and guess what? Worship are for the believer. It's for the family. It's for the ones that have been called out and separated. It's not meant to be shared with everyone. It's for those that have the spiritual bond with Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speak the truth in love, that you may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Verse 3 in this text says, Truth that abides. God's truth that abides. Abide means dwell or bond it. It says, God's truth that abides will remain with us, how long? Forever. It's not going to stop in this world. It's connected. Jesus and truth is connected forever. You can't separate truth from God. And this is what John's saying. There's one truth. So how do we know the truth? Simple. Small steps of obedience in a long direction. It sounds simple. The concept is simple. But it's, it, it can be, it, it's impossible to walk out in your own human effort. You have to be made new. You have to be changed. The Spirit of God needs to be placed inside of you. There needs to be a great exchange that happens. This is why people pray and read, memorize, be around other Christians going in the same direction. You want to know why? Because life is difficult if you haven't figured it out. There's a real tension in this world between sinful obsession and sinful desires versus doing God's will for your life. Does anybody ever feel that tension? It's real. If you're walking as a believer. Now, Donnie doesn't struggle with this. So you can talk to him afterwards. <laughs> but life is difficult. If you're walking with God, there's always this tension that happens in our world. So how do we walk the small steps of obedience in a long direction? We pray. We read. We memorize. We're around other people going in the same direction. We have people that mentor us and call out sin in our world. We have to make Jesus, our new priority in life. There's a scene from Elf I love. Like, like he goes and, and works like in, 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 uh, in this like department store. He like shows up one day and he doesn't even work there, but the guy puts on the work. And what he said was, you like work now. This is what you like. Whatever it is you like before, we have to understand we don't like that anymore. You know what we like? We love Jesus. We love living for him and doing God's will. That's what we love. That's what you love going forward. I don't know anything about you, but this is what you love going forward because life is difficult people quit people give up they can't take the pressure anymore it's hard too many times we're trying to walk or to do things as a measure to reach god there's an effort that goes behind salvation yes but that doesn't have to necessarily be the way jesus said my my yoke is easy. My burden's light. Be led by the Spirit. Be moved by the truth. Ask God for His will to join our life. Some people even say Jesus hasn't worked. There's a guy that we do ministry with for a long time who sat down and screamed at me one day how angry he was because he's been trying this Christian thing for 15 years and it just doesn't work for him. He just gave up. Now, if you knew, if you knew, Gnosko, we talk about it regularly, if you've experienced God's love in truth, you would know that God will never give up on you. Whatever you're going through, whatever the struggles that you have, God never gives up. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, yes. But he says, I'll never leave you, nor I'll never forsake you. This thing will never work if I'm trying to do it in my own human effort. It only happens when I'm made new and I get new desires. That has to happen every single day. God's truth will never pass away. So we need to know God's truth. Guess what? Because we know it, you know what we get to do every day? 
practice. We're talking about practice. Yeah, we're talking about practice, Allen Iverson. Maybe if you showed up at practice, we would have won the championship. We need to practice God's truth. 4 through 8 says this. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. As we receive commandment from the Father, now I plead with you, lady, not as I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which you have heard from the beginning, here it is, that we love one another. It's the same. It's always been there. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments, not our own ways or desires, whatever the world tells you to do. We walk by his commandments. And this, this is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, and you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver, an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. John is glad that he finds this woman's lady or hears reports that they're walking in truth. They're standing up for God's truth based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's so happy that he hears that someone else, especially the next generation of believers, are actually living and being obedient to Christ. You guys know how hard it is to stand up to the world, to actually believe in something that everybody's going against. John is so excited when this happens. Man, I get excited when I see Max actually playing nice with Ava and being kind. I really make him out to be like a little terror, you know, and, and he is like 50% of the time, and he's just like kind of cute the other, but walking, what we're talking about today, practicing or walking means moving through life, being controlled or being obedient to the truth of Jesus Christ. Meaning God's word is to, guess what, not just be believed, but to be lived. I heard my pastor once say, I don't care what translation that you read in this, as long as you're living it out. Live it out. Can't just believe and do your own thing. We have to live it out. Sometimes we forget that God's word is what gives us new life. And being filled with the Holy Spirit. We walk in the newness of life. We walk by faith. And by the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit's job is to testify of the Son and to convict the world of sin. He's our, he's our convictor. God's Word is supposed to be a lamp to our feet. And we talk about this all the time. 2 Timothy 3.16 God's Word is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness that the man or woman of God is thoroughly equipped for good works. You want to be thoroughly equipped to walk after God? Know His Word. Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. The commandment to God is to follow after him. Obedience is not optional. Simply state it, what do you believe? Guess what? I'll show you what you believe by what you do. We're called. We're the elect. We're chosen to live consistently with God's word that lives inside of us. And this is what should control us. And when you mess up, guess what? You will mess up. We have a God that we can run to for forgiveness and covering and restoration. So uh, our house is like opposite of this. And we have these stairs. And uh, Ava, once she got to a certain age, just like wants to climb up the stairs. And you guys with little kids will get there one day. You'll have your own challenges. So we figured out that we'd put this gate up and... You know, so after some time, Ava figured out how she could, like, squeeze into the gate. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to zip tie the gate to the thing. I'm just going to literally zip tie it, and she can't get up. And then she found a hole on the other side, and she would, like, squeeze under the hole and get up. And we're like, what the heck? So we literally have this gate that's, like, this high that every time you go up and down the stairs, you have to hop over. All right? There's a reason why I'm telling you this. Yesterday, I was coming down, carrying a bunch of stuff, running down, trying to get over the gate. Guess what happened? I slipped and fell over the gate. Stepping over the gate can expose you to certain areas where it's not too fun for a gate to hit you. All that to say, the gate fell over with me on it. I was not a happy camper. I said some things that were unholy and unpleasing. Max ran away. Emily freaked out. And Ava laughed. She thought it was great. 
literally I felt horrible afterwards. You, you, you know what I could have did? I could have slowed down. I could have took my time. I could have asked somebody for help for carrying some things. I could have paid attention. I could have lived in the moment. I could have asked to be a reflection of Christ, not five years from now, but today, mm. here, now, in this moment. Man, I had to own my behavior and go back and apologize to Emily. And How do you apologize to little Max? You just body slam him a few times. He loves it. <laughs> I wanted to highlight that. I know what it's like to make the mistake when you're practicing things. I was just doing my business. I wasn't living for Jesus Christ. You know what helps? Is daily, minute by minute, to practice the virtues and the commandments of Jesus Christ. I'm never going to change. I'm always doing the same thing. And if I'm always doing the same thing, I really have to ask, did Jesus actually change me? John reminds us that what you heard about God's commandment has never changed. He commands us to walk in love and truth. And guess what? Many deceivers, there's deceivers out there that are looking to throw people, uh, to help people go astray. Here's what you need to know about deceivers. First thing is, according to the text, they deny the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They deny that he came as 100% man and 100% God. Some people will say, well, he wasn't really God. He was probably just a really good guy. You've heard that. Jesus wasn't God. He was just some good guy. Other people say, well, he was really God, but he didn't have any connection to us in his humanity. Oh, yeah? You see him cry. You see him feel pain. He's hungry. He sleeps. You see his humanity written all over the text. Then you get into Hebrews and you realize he's walked through everything we walk through. He wouldn't ask anybody to do something he didn't do already. These individuals are labeled deceivers, translated wanderers, not wanderers. Now from Delco, I don't know how that comes out to anyone else. They're not wandering, they're wandering. They're going to and fro looking for anybody that can get a hold of their tasty ear. You know what that means? A lot of people in here and in the world love gossip. Can you believe what so-and-so is saying? Can you believe what Donnie did this week? Can you believe what Pastor John did? Can you believe what Noah said? Can you believe so? No, that's not the truth. You've got to listen to this truth. Literally, these wanderers are called antichrists. They're deceivers. Wanderers, they are against the kingdom of God, and they are against you for walking in the kingdom of God. They are moving to throw as many people off their walk with Jesus as possible. This is why we practice our walk day in and day out. There is no days off. This is a war. We have a peacetime mentality in, 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 in a time of war. Basically, these type of deceivers are dangerous for the church. They look to lead people astray from what they believe in. We see it in the garden in day one. Well, not literally day one in the garden. But the first temptation we see is, is Satan coming up saying, did God really say? Now, I don't know about you. I don't need anybody to say that. I ask myself that question all the time. You're like, can I do this? I don't know. Did God really say I shouldn't do it? Yes, God actually said that. Jesus said in the end times, false Christ will arise. Guess what? In the end times, they'll actually show great signs and wonder to mislead the elect, if possible, even the elect. In the end times... It's possible there's going to be people that rise up. They're going to show great signs and wonders. They're going to heal people and bring food and do all sorts of great things. And it's going to look like the kingdom of God. It's going to be a copy, not the original thing. The enemy wants to kill, steal, and divide and destroy. The question is, what do we do now? As pastors and leaders... And individuals as followers, we have to watch so we don't lose what's accomplished. It says it in the text. We must understand biblical teaching. The Bureans in the text were the people that listened to Paul and then they went out and searched what somebody said day in and day out. Whatever you hear has to go through a filter. We must hold our, our, our leaders and each other 
uh, to characters list character like character traits listed in First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. When you meet with somebody or, 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 or you're with the church, a big question to ask is who's their sending leader? Are they accountable to someone else? We were just at an event with somebody that started some ministry and we were like, oh, so where do you come out of? And he's like, oh, I didn't like the people in my church, so I went out and started my own thing. You're like, red flag. We're not saying that person's bad or evil in any way. There's just red flags. We have to be able to see if there's red flags going to stop to pay attention. We just don't take everything on face value. And guess what? For somebody to be a spiritual leader, you have to be accountable to other people. There should be a board. There should be uh, leaders. You know, there should be people to speak into your life. There should be a pastor. I made a joke. I was teaching at CC Delco last week. I said, hey, if anybody has a problem with me, please email my pastor, Pastor Bob Gaglione, and tell him he's responsible for me. I wrote earlier that uh, I can't walk today on yesterday's faith or yesterday's truth. For me. I need my faith in what God has for me today and here and now. I don't live off the football game that happened last week. No, I'm, 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 I want to be present in what God's doing in my heart and my mind here and today through the Holy Spirit. Now I also understand what I do yesterday has an effect on what I do today. And that's important. We have over 2,000 years of church history to point back to. And guess what? We can trust those faithful leaders that have stood on truth. Guess what? We're all going to be flawed in some possible way. I think Spurgeon said it's like some of his theology can only be possibly like around 80% or something. False teachers and deceivers can make you lose something in this world. Now, if you're born again, no one can take you away from Christ. But guess what? You can face real challenges in this world and, if possible, lose a reward that happens in heaven heaven later on. We'll have to talk about that at another time. But as believers, we have to be discerning. Discernment is a virtue. A discerning individual is considered to possess wisdom and to be in good judgment especially so with regard to matters overlooked by other people. Discernment is a real spiritual gift. We have to be willing to stand for Christ in every faucet of life. We have to be able to hear, is that truth or is that a lie? Well, Pastor John, guess what? Watching horror movies isn't that big of a deal. Hey, I'm not saying anything about horror movies. You've got to get along with God and search you out. But I do know this, everything is a big deal, by the way. Everything is a big deal. Do you know how I know that? I'm going to tell you how I know that for a fact. Because there was a day that I decided to go have a few drinks with a friend. And there was a day I decided to smoke a cigarette. And there was a day that I decided to smoke a little pot. And then there was a day I decided to do a little bit of LSD. And then a little bit of cocaine. And then a little bit of meth. And then a little bit of heroin and overdosed and died and ended up in rehab in prison. Listen, uh, uh, we got to be careful about what you, we let into our mind and in our hearts. Things that start very, very small can lead into big challenges later on in life. I still see images in my mind of magazines I looked at when I was five, six, seven years old. I can see those things. A song comes on the radio and I can put myself right back in that same position where I heard that song the first time. We have to be incredibly careful of what we allow into our world, especially not only for us, but everybody's watching what we're doing. If I'm out doing all sorts of weird things, well, Pastor John can do it. I can do it too. No, we can't do that. We need to be accountable for each other. Hey, man, this, I, I don't know what's going on here, but this may not look right. We, we need to know that the slow, progressive road always leads to destruction. Jesus said that road is wide. Many are traveling in that direction. You want to know if you're on the right road? Look around. There shouldn't be a lot of people there. <laughs> Literally. If you're walking in a road and everybody's going there, you should extremely question what's going on in your life. 
Proverbs 18.16 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty, arrogant spirit before the fall. So how do we protect the truth? John lays it out here in verses 9 to 13. Whoever transgresses, it means breaking boundaries. It means breaking into a school at the end of the street. Whoever transgress, transgresses does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You want to meet and walk with the Father and Son? It starts with abiding in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, this is why we understand doctrine and teaching, if someone comes and doesn't bring this doctrine, he says, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares with his evil deeds. And he closes out by saying, having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do it with ink and, ink and paper, but basically what he says is, I hope to come with you and speak to face to face why that your joy may be full or your joy complete the children of your elect sister greet you amen we must be aware of those who deceive those who destroy and those that are willing to depart from the truth verse 9 talks about going too far literally means to go beyond the established Boundaries, it means there's a failure to obey. There, there, there's a problem. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. He's saying, I'm taking a stand. I'm walking in truth, not only for mine, in obedience with God, but it's for your benefit. He says this, that you may learn by us to not go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Any teaching or any doctrine not consistent with Scripture is to be rejected. Those that do it might claim to have God, but clearly do not abide or dwell in Christ. It's really easy to make a mistake. I think everybody said something crazy at some point or off the wall or had some weird thought. We understand what it's like to make mistakes. But what John is talking about is people who have already made up teachings outside of Scripture and have perverted the teachings of Jesus Christ, and guess what? Aren't willing to be able to be turned back to the truth. What he's really addressing is hospitality for travelers. See, during that time, there, we, you didn't have a way to search people out. People traveled town to town to town to have traveling teachers or speakers to come into your church. So it was common to meet with somebody as a church because why? Because we love people and we have grace and we have compassion. Oh, come and stay at my house. I'll give you great hospitality. Oh, you're from another place? Just come and be with me right away. There's like no interview whatsoever. You're just going to like let anybody into your house? You're not, you don't have like five questions you should ask everybody? No, just come and hang out with my house and have access to my kids and my money and my family and everything. Hospitality for travelers was, travelers was common during that time, as it is now. But we don't invite people into our homes, into the inner parts of our world who will lead other people astray, which means you have to be able to test the people that you're allowing into your world. And if you do invite them in, they come along the way, they get access to your people. And guess what? They use that as evidence to go to other churches. You know what they say? Pastor Donnie let me in, so Pastor Donnie approved this, so it must be okay. Pastor John let me come and share at his church, so it must be okay for me to go share at their church. You guys see how it works. It's guilt by association. You know what we have today that they didn't have then? We don't even need to go out to have false teaching or false doctrine. It's in your houses already. It's in your pocket. The TV, the radio, printed material. In the old days, you have to go search out sin. You have to go find a group of people doing something shady. Now you don't have to do that. It's in your house. You don't need to leave anywhere. You can get alone. You can hear any message on anything you want. You can download or look at anything you can possibly dream of. And you can order anything to show up and arrive at your house. 
can all be found in your home with a push of a button. <coughs> we really don't even think that there's a battle being fought anymore. Ephesians 6 says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but it's against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. A war has been set and waged against God and his people. Don't forget that in later, the woman, no relation to this text, Satan, hates the people of God and has waged a war against him here and now. When we co-sign, someone clearly false teaching basic doctrine of Jesus Christ and all doctrine, the majors is where we stand. We become a co-conspirator against the truth of Jesus Christ. Here's the deal. We as believers need to understand biblical boundaries. Boundaries are like a fence, and a fence usually has a gate. A gate lets people in and out. Our church is not a country club looking for elite members. We're not looking for the most wealthy, the best looking, the dress best. By the way, we would flunk just looking at this group of people here and now. I'm just saying. Not looking for elite people. Church isn't looking for good people. The church looks to see people forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ all belong, who want to be redeemed and be made new. We need to spend our time around lost people. Too many people hear things from this and automatically they shut their doors to anyone, you know, put boards over the windows and don't let anybody in. As a result of this message, there was a group of people that decided, all right, we'll never let foreign travelers into our house again. We'll never hear anything from the approved people. No. We need to spend our time as the church, as born-again born believers, around lost people. How else will they know you by your love? Amen. We should invite lost people into our homes and share meals and invite them to events and church. They need to be exposed to the ways of God. Sinners need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They get to hear it and see it when they're around born-again believers. God's truth, God's love, God's grace. But the line becomes drawn when someone does not want to follow Jesus and invites you to be a follower of them. Here's my story behind that. I lived in media for a long time and as someone in recovery, you know, and as, you know, uh, extroverted as I am, can you imagine me talking to my neighbors? So it's a big apartment complex. I would always talk to this guy, Olgi. He's a good friend of mine. And Olgi almost every night would invite me to go out to the bar, to, bar with him. And after some time, finally I turned and said, and I said, oh, I can't go to the bar. I'll come home, and then I'll steal all your stuff. And I'll wake up in handcuffs the next day. Guess how many times he asked me to go out drinking with him after that? Zero. People will invite you along to join their fellowship. It's called sin. The line needs to be drawn between us inviting people into our world to be exposed by it, so they can hear the gospel, experience love, versus people inviting us to be part of them. Here's another one. Someone comes in, a lost individual. They get saved. They, they drink the blood of Jesus Christ. They get baptized. They make a public declaration of walking with Jesus. And in that, the church's job is to hold that person accountable for that walk. But that person is not willing to become like Christ. You meet with them regularly, time and time again, to say, hey, the way you're walking, it's not of God. There's some things that you're doing that are challenging. We love you. We want to help you through this. And they clearly decide they don't want to walk with you anymore. But they still show up every Sunday. You know what the word says? 1 Corinthians 5.11. But I'm now writing to you that you may not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister. There's people that claim to be a brother and sister, that claim to be in fellowship, but is sexually immoral is greedy, an idler, a slanderer, a drunkard, a drunkard, a swindler. Do not eat with such people. What business of it is mine to judge those outside of the church? This is what Paul's writing. What business is mine to judge the people outside of the church? You know what he says? Aren't you supposed to judge people inside? 
People walk around and say, eh, only God can judge me. You're not supposed to judge me. No. We can't judge someone's condemnation, where they're going in the end time. That's between them and God. Yes, we should be able to judge called discernment if something's of God or something's not of God. And we bring that to other people and highlight that and ask them to reconcile with God. Paul says, God will judge those outside, but the people inside expel the wicked or moral, unmoral person among you. This is what he's saying. When someone comes into the church, we're supposed to help and guide them along the way. And if they're not walking correctly, give plenty of opportunity and time. But there comes a time where you have to say, this isn't for you. You're not part of the fellowship. You're denying the basic facts of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We are to protect by bringing the lost, walking with others through their sinful obsessions, teaching them God's word and pointing them to Christ. We're to hold people accountable. We're to be honest, offer help, and help people grive and throw. Uh, grive, grive. Grow and thrive. I just made up a new word. <laughs> but if someone is not willing, and they're hurting others, they're not part of the church. They're of the world. And we have to break up. Guess what? Breakups are messy. They stink. What I've learned is you should be direct. Do it quick. Because love hurts. False teachers, deceivers, and prophets cannot stay with us. Basically, if we allow people to walk in that, we're, we're, we're co-signing their behavior and saying it's okay. We always want to pray and see people transformed. We don't gossip, talk about them. We always give food and water to people that are in need 100% of the time. Not 99, 100% of the time. The word says, God will deal with the enemies then. We help people if they have a need, but we don't fellowship or have like-minded bonds with them anymore this means we have to take time to talk to people to ask questions to listen to pray before we let them into our family all can come not all belong and john closes this letter out and he lets us know throughout this letter how do we know the truth you know how we know the truth we learn God's word, we read it, we study, we memorize, we share it with other people. He tells us to walk in truth. How do we do that? We allow God's word to guide us in thoughts, actions, and deeds. We allow his spirit to change us from the inside out. When this happens, our walk becomes a testimony to the world because we are conformed by Christ and Christ has overcome the world. How do we protect the truth? Sin is always pushing the boundaries, by the way. How do we protect the truth? We teach others. We call out sin and destructive behaviors. We also need to challenge false teachings and don't let people into our houses. And that means social media, whatever it might be on the internet. We need to be like interviewers, finding out about the messages Movies, books, friends and family, and people who can influence us. There's always an influence. Remember, boundaries are important like a fence. It, it, it's, it, 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 the information, we have to be able to flow what information comes into our world or not. I always heard somebody say, garbage in, garbage out. What you're listening to, what you do, you will live out. And bad company corrupts good behavior. We sit under God's word. We walk in God's word, and we ask God's word to protect us. You know Jesus died for your sins? You know, that's the good news. You know what the news is nobody else wants to hear? That now it's our turn to die to ourselves. There's a step that has to be taken. We deny ourselves every single day. Pick up our cross to follow after him. Jesus died for us. Our response is to die to ourselves daily, to live after him everywhere we go. I love step 11 because it says this, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my contact with God as we understood God. I don't like that part, but I like this part. Praying only for the knowledge of God's will and for the power to carry it out. My marching orders for today is to be able to get alone with God 
Ask God for his will. And ask God to change your will to live out his. Only knowledge for God's will and the power to carry it out. Not looking for jackpot in the sky, a new relationship, a better car, whatever might be your situation, you're asking asking for God to change. Ask God to change you. I'm asking for God to change me, my heart, my mind, and my soul, to be able to live after him. And there's a real way for us to walk in this world, but we have to understand God's love and what the real truth is in this world. Amen? So we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up now, and we're going to share communion. I'm going to ask Andy to pass it out. If you guys have to go or whatever, do, yeah, do, do, do what you got to do. We're going to close out today in communion as the body of Christ. And as this is coming out, I just want to remember what Jesus did during the Last Supper. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper during Passover with his disciples and probably a group of women as well. Right before he went to the cross, he gave his life. says this in Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, Say, Take it. Eat it. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin but I say to you I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom the next time we get to do this it's going to be with him the next time we do this out of this world is going to be with Jesus he's going to have a communion with us But while he was here, this piece of bread that they're passing out in front of us represents Jesus' body. It's pierced, becomes broken by him. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it, and he said, eat this. This is my body. I just want everybody to bow their head for just one second. Take a moment to reflect on what Christ did for us, coming in human form in his own body, broken, bruised, pierced for our transgression. God, thank you that you said, those that feed on me will live because of me. God, we pray that we are consumed with you always. Anytime we do this, we do this in remembrance of you. Please eat the bread. took the cup he gave thanks drink of it all of you for this is my blood the new covenant which was shed for the remission of sins let's drink said when this was done that they sung a hymn together They went out to the Mount of Olives together as one unit bonded over Jesus' body and his blood, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Father God, as we sing this final hymn, Lord, God, we pray that we can walk in truth and be you here and now, Lord, in this world. God, help us to guide us through the messiness of life. That we reach the people who you called us to reach. And to leave love behind in every situation. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.